The first thing that science says is that uh, many of the traditional ideas about God, about how God acts in the world, uh, are, are definitely wrong. They're naive. And I won't belabor that. There's you know, enormous literature on that, and you know, the arguments that. are well known. The ancient texts, which are the basis of most of the traditional religions, uh, don't do justice to what we know about the universe now. They, with rare exceptions, don't have uh, a notion of that the universe could be enormously large, uh, much less that it can contain extravagant numbers of dimensions in quantum <laughs> mechanics, and, uh, or that it's so very old. Uh, or, most of all, I think, most profoundly, that it's so comprehensible that it can be understood in terms of precise mathematical laws. You just don't find that in the ancient text. So uh, to me, they, they seem kind of cramped and unimaginative. So it's not so much even that they're wrong, although some details are wrong, it's just that they don't do justice to what we know today. Can you explain everything about who we human beings are by looking at the physiognomy of the brain. Is it as simple as that? Does it come down to what you've just uh, once described as understanding that sort of um, block of jelly inside the head and that ultimately explains everything about the way human beings are and the way we perceive ourselves and others? I think the answer to that question is almost certainly yes. Um, things like creativity, you may go, go up to a certain point in explaining it, and, or you have to start saying it's a divine spark or something which we scientists don't believe in. So eventually the answer is yes, we're going to explain many different aspects of brain function. What does God mean? And to some groups of people in the world, it means a rather human-like figure who takes a personal interest in the destiny of humans, sometimes intervenes. Um, some in extreme cases wants human sacrifices and all the rest. Uh, I think most scientists find that as too simplistic a view of reality. Plus we've seen how societies from primitive situ situations grew into more sophisticated ones and they dropped those kinds of attitudes and began to try to develop ideas that dealt better with the realities we find now. So I, I think that that's what influences scientific thinking. I think that religion has always been one of my interests, looking at it as an essentially human product uh, with all its elaborations, conceptualizations, and, and so on. It's certainly true that um, there are, there, there's, there's nothing that science is teaching us about how we are that supports different religious fables about what we're supposed to be. Um, magic is not substantiated in science or in philosophy. But I think in the 21st century people are pretty, pretty free to say what they want about the Bible. People are free, or, or will, are free to reject it. I found actually the best evidence for my own research was going to uh, Christian bookstores. And there were all these books about apparent contradictions in the Bible, seeming inconsistencies. Books and books of these things were because the biblical the Bible scholars noticed that there were th these two different versions: two of every animal on the ark, seven of every animal, and they were trying to work out, you know, what was the real what was the real version. Of course, there is no correct version from a folklorist point of view. So they gave me all the evidence I needed. All I had to do was to look up the so their passages, and I saw, yeah, there these are two different versions of the same story. So they didn't they they were my research assistants. These people who were trying to. Uh, to reconcile these. They mean, you know, Reason, of course, can be defined in a variety of ways, but these are pretty, pretty good approximations. A cause, explanation, or justification for an action or event. You, know, you have a reason to do X. Um, you know, there was a reason why I got up um, from my chair, I went to the refrigerator, and got a beer, because I was thirsty. Right? That's a reason. Uh, the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic, of course, is what we're talking about here in, in this context. This is opposed to, of course, faith, uh, which is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Notice the accent on un incomplete. Or a strong belief in God or in doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. And that's the interesting 
uh, the interesting uh, term here, it's spiritual apprehension. What the heck is spiritual apprehension? How do people spiritually apprehend things? I can talk about how people logically or rationally think about certain things, but it is hard for me to get my mind wrapped around the idea of a spiritual apprehension. I suspect because there's no such a thing as a spiritual apprehension. Because God or any other supernatural agent doesn't have what it takes to act upon physical things. <laughs> Uh, th that seems to me to be the underlying problem in all this. We extend our talk of things we're familiar with to God, forgetting how much it is based in familiar facts about the physical world. And we just suppose it's making sense. It looks similar language when we take it to this different domain. But, but, but science um, and superstition um, are never going to, you can never reconcile them. I mean, if you believe that, that truth lies in um, strange scrolls um, dug up from somewhere or other, written by someone, um, then there's no, there's no logical counter to that. Does the soul have a personality? Well, it turns out that if you have certain strokes in certain parts of the brain up here, your personality changes. You get a different personality. Well, who's, you know, without that part of the brain, whose personality is the soul. So the soul is not, doesn't see, doesn't hear, doesn't think, uh, doesn't have emotions, and doesn't have a personality. Okay, whose soul is it? And what good is it? You know, it, it doesn't fit the usual notion of a soul as you, as you are. I see that we have enormous amounts to discover as a strategy for going forward as human beings. I believe atheism makes coherent sense. All the, all the religions are in conflict with one another. They have different stories. They have stories which are based on insubstantial uh, records. They all justify their stories, of course, by saying that there was some direct communication from a deity or, 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 or other entity in the past that, that has led them to this line of belief. I, but I find those unconvincing, and particularly I find them unconvincing because of the conflict. This was my main argument when I was discussing it with my father, that I couldn't, and he, he, you know, he found it obviously hard to answer that. It's one of the most difficult questions for believers to answer. If there's a law of non-contradiction, that is just to say that it's a claim that it's just fundamentally irrational to contradict yourself, I don't see any reason to conclude from that that there must be some cosmic logician laying down that law. Well, similarly then, I want to say that with regard to the various moral requirements, uh, we don't need a law giver for them to be genuine requirements. We, if we want, we can say, in fact, it seems to be a perfectly legitimate thing to say, that reason requires that we act in accordance with reasons. There are, it lays down these various categorical reasons not to harm people, to aid them. Uh, and so uh, we can personify reason in that way, but all we just mean, I think, is that there are these compelling, decisive, objective, categorical reasons to behave in certain ways and not behave uh, in other ways. I have never had any feeling uh, for the intelligent designer approach. The one thing is clear, it takes one great deal of intelligence to figure out what's going on. And uh, I think there are more than a few people who, having figured some of this out, feel well, uh, they are uh, <laughs> somehow <laughs> Uh, getting down to the same thought processes that went on in creating it all, uh, that doesn't mean a thing to me. I am not against people being religious. I think it helps you a great deal. I'm against religion when it interferes in the lives of other people. Um, I'm very happy to discuss this. I'm not, in other words, if you believe, for example, that the fertilized egg is really a human being, which some people in religious organizations believe, then I'm very hostile to you because it's nonsense. This is one of my subjects, developmental biology. Or if, for example, you're against contraception for religious reason, and therefore AIDS, as it were, can become more common. So I'm not against people having a belief in God. I do believe that that belief is false. And I'm saved by the fact that whatever arguments I give you, 
I have no illusion, I have no delusion, that I will persuade you to change your minds. Roger was careful to say I was born into a Zoroastrian family. I stopped believing roughly around the age of eight, and um, by 12 had written my personal essay. That hasn't changed much in the last several decades. Exactly. Um, so you get omnipotence, and you realize that to have omnipotence, you've got to have God is unchanging, but you forget that by adding unchanging in order to keep omnipotence, that's going to conflict with active in the world. Right. And you lose the omnipotence because now he can't act in the world. Right. And so the problem is to keep the whole thing into a coherent bundle. Uh, and even if there's not a logical contradiction in there, I don't see how that's going to happen. Yeah, when, when you talk about decent scientists today who are religious, ask them very carefully precisely what it is they believe. I mean, some of them go to church because they like the music. Some of them believe in some sort of pantheistic um, spirit of the universe. Then they, They're using a word like God. Einstein was one of these. Einstein used the word God a lot. And plenty of people think, because of that, that Einstein was a religious man. Well, he wasn't. He certainly, I mean, he's most indignant when anybody suggested that Einstein believed in a personal God. The other one I should mention is the idea of the mind being separate to the body. Technically, we call this mind-body dualism. And this is something that most people assume without ever questioning it. They assume the mind is somehow independently of the body because we experience that every day. You know, we have a thought about having a cup of coffee and then we move our hand to pick it up. And we never really question that idea that somehow the mind can control the physical system. So mind-body dualism is a fascinating area, both in science but also in philosophy. And this assumption that the mind is separate to the body is something that children at four or five years of age will spontaneously think about. But if you then make that assumption, then that means the mind isn't constrained by the same laws that constrain the physical body, which then allows for the possibility of an afterlife, the mind somehow existing once the body is gone. So you can see very easily how that kind of notion could underpin notions of the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, and so forth. The trouble with religion is it picks particular things, like why are we here, or what created the world, or what should we do in various conditions. Mm -hmm. And lots of these can be uh, studied and, and uh, understood a little better by thinking more. But uh, our cultures find ways, and it's the cultural rather than the individual, who say, we like things as they are, don't think about this, don't change it. What you should do is told by this book. And that's very convenient, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> At any period, if there are questions science can't answer because there are no tools, then why knock yourself out? And the culture, I can regard religion as wonderful ways to save a person's time. They can get more done in their life if they don't think about hard questions. The only trouble is that most of the time those questions could be answered if you knew more. At the epistemological like level, it is very clear that there was a fierce battle between science and religion and that scientific advances showed that all so-called sources of religious knowledge were not valid sources of religious knowledge at all. Speaking as a scientist, I think that there is a problem with regards to the afterlife and religious immortality, and that is there's no proof that it exists. Remarkable claims require remarkable proof. But maybe you don't need proof. Well, I do. Yeah. What is your feeling now? Are you, how would you classify yourself? Um, Agnostic? I suppose so, yes. Uh, hmm. Perhaps. Yeah. I think the, um, the culture of religion, if one can put it like that, hmm. or, or what um, religious people have done in, in our history is so huge and enormous. I mean, it's just so much part of the background of being a, a European person. Mm -hmm that you, can't, you absolutely can't ignore it and, and to understand it you've got to have some feeling for what it is to be mm. religious in it, I think. Mm. So is there an alternative when you ask the why something exists? Must you have a personal creator? Or is there something different? Yeah, this is a question I've thought about for many, many years. And of course, if you say that we exist because something else created this, and then something else created that, you're always sort of looking for one more thing that made that. But I think there is one kind of object out there which was clearly not created ever. And they are mathematical objects, like the cube. 
I'm not talking about a sugar cube or a particularly physical cube here, but just a mathematical object known as to mathematicians as the cube, or the dodecahedron, or the sphere, or a vector space, or whatnot. These things, these concepts, these concepts, they clearly exist outside of space and time. They were not the cube wasn't created 14 billion years ago, right? And yet you still feel that it exists in the sense that. It, it's not like we invented the cube. The whole idea that there could be a cube is very not, not arbitrary not at all. Even I suppose I'm a rational humanist or something. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a, hmm. a cop out. It's, um, yeah, I find myself quite annoyed, I suppose, by my dedicated religious affiliation. Hmm. But uh, it gives a lot of comfort to some people, so I must be tolerant. I don't think it would be better if there were no Jesus. Uh, it, it's a matter of indifference. It, it, and there might have been, but it just seems to me uh, the burden of proof is on the person that would say that there was, because it's just special pleading again. You want special treatment for your favorite savior. I mean, why are there no Mithraists or Apollonius of Tyana advocates out there making these cases? No, it's only representatives uh, of fundamentalist Christianity. Uh, here are a few, uh, a few statements that I think most of, uh, almost all of us would agree with. First, that uh, I think Dawkins is right that uh, there's, you know, the, the Noma idea should be discarded and that if there are gods and creator gods, the world would be different and probably measurably different. Um, uh, secondly, as, also as Dawkins says, we can't be certain. Uh, you know, we, we can't all rate ourselves as seven out of seven on the certainty scale. Um, but uh, our world does not appear to be a world with gods. And if that is true, then the historical, cosmological, and causal claims of religions are mostly uh, or perhaps even entirely in some cases false. Um, so I do agree with, with, with Dan and with, with Sam Harris and with the, the uh, uh, other recent writers um, that the factual claims of religion are by and large false and, and I would never say that we should hide that or shush it or, or do something because we don't want to upset them. So I, I'm on board with all of those claims. <clears throat> I think, you know, we should fight creationism and when asked, say that we don't believe in religion but I don't think we should uh, sort of upset those people who do, who are a very large number of reasonable and decent people. The total inability has that, that God has to implement anything, to be in any form discernible. I have no measure possible, and I know that even those who believe in God deeply know that there is no possible way. So, since there is no, no possible way for of discerning its existence. Of proving his existence. No, discern, measure something that tells me that God exists. Anything. So, are we saying that discernment is the same thing as measurement? Yes, indeed. In this case, for me, it is that. Is it in every case? In every, in every case there... that I know concerning my cognition or concerning my ability to understand things. I mean, okay. I, I've never been religious. Uh, uh, my parents weren't either. Um, and so it, 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 I mean, you know, it never seemed to me, I mean, I, I've never been able to connect with the religious way of thought. The way the data are now, it's pretty clear that there is only the physical brain that we think and feel, make decisions and plan as a result of activity and processes in the physical brain. That there is no, in addition to the physical brain, there is no non-physical mind or soul or spooky stuff of the kind that might, for example, survive the death of the brain. So when I think about naturalization of the mind, I think about trying to understand the nature of mental processes, mental diseases, and so forth, in terms of brain function. And Aristotle would tell you things like, uh, if you have an object and you want it to be in motion, you have to keep pushing it, because if you stop, it stops. And Aristotle was right. It stopped when I stopped pushing it. He was not wrong. I mean, physicists like to make fun of Aristotle these days, but he was right in the context that he was talking about. So if you believe that as a fundamental fact about stuff in the world, motion only exists when there's something pushing it, then you can imagine that these kinds of arguments make sense. That the fact that we see things moving in the universe, despite the fact that motion requires a mover, 
makes you believe that there must be some prime mover out there behind the whole thing. And then comes along Galileo and Newton. And they say, actually, if you think about it carefully, the natural status for objects is uniform motion. It's just because of friction and dissipation and other annoying features of the world that we see things stop. That at a fundamental level, things want to keep moving, and unless you act upon them, they will remain in uniform motion. This notion, conservation of momentum, completely undermined the sort of metaphysical the reasoning behind the arguments for first cause and a prime mover and things like that. And you can actually see the impact on the theological literature. Once they invented Newtonian mechanics, arguments for the existence of God changed their focus from prime movers, first cause, arguments from contingency to the argument from design. They started inventing machines and they said, oh yeah, it looks like a machine and maybe there was a machinist and so forth. And then Darwin, to a good extent, undercut that argument, and then we, uh, we are still living in the aftermath of that. The simple uh, question that I can answer immediately is that about personal God. And that I don't believe. The God who concerns himself with uh, human affairs, uh, I don't think we have uh, much evidence for that. Um, as for more abstract God, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, some people suggest the level of abstraction which I think makes, makes the concept pointless. Um, if we identify God with the laws of nature, uh, I don't see why we need another term for the laws of nature. Right. Because until somebody defines what they mean by God and what they mean by exists, the question, does God exist, is nonsense. It, it gets you nowhere. Uh, but I would also add that I agree with DJ on, on, on the absence of evidence question. I mean, if you've got if you've got something that's invisible and impalpable, it's indistinguishable from something that's non-existent. So why should we accept that? That, in addition to being able to do experiments and being able to observe and measure, another thing that a good scientist has to be able to do is clearly state where he got his information from. And if you're just daydreaming it out into existence. Uh, that doesn't count. That's, that's not a good reason to believe in something. Uh, that, that's a reason to, maybe wishful thinking is a reason to believe in it, but it, it's, it's not a good scientific or skeptical reason to accept something. Now, I must tell you then, if that's still of interest, I'd, I'd keep away from the subject of religion nowadays. Um, it, when I was 10 or 11, I said I was in a refugee camp. I asked my father the pertinent question, why? Why are we in a refugee camp? Why are they trying to kill us? And he told me very honestly, look, these are riots between people of the Hindu religion and people of the Muslim religion. So the, it's a religious um, conflict that is taking place. And that's how it is. It is partly on land, of course, but I was that not to know. And I decided then, as a thinking child, that religion was not good for one. <laughs> and so religion was abandoned then. Mm -hmm. It then abandoned forcefully. My mother was aware of it and scolded me sometimes, you know, you mustn't do that. You don't understand, you're not old enough. But I had talked with him, he had been completely honest with me, and then he accepted that I would not have any religious belief after that. And that has remained the case? That has totally remained the case. And it remained the case as I sat through many religious services. That, uh, mm. originally. Uh, uh, reason and science was, uh, was intended, uh, was deism, not atheism. That we were going to use reason to discover about the Creator. Um, and the secondly, that this was suffused, at least in the proponents of, uh, of enlightenment, with a profound sense of optimism that science and reason can improve the human condition. That's something that was true of the 19th century, uh, but not now. So what, uh, what happened? Uh, one thing is that deism morphed into atheism, so now deism, to the extent that it exists, only survives, as someone said earlier today, by encapsulating itself and protecting itself from any kind of empirical inquiry. So if you're going to use science and reason now, uh, then you're going to be an atheist, not a, uh, um, a deist. The Bible, the, second thing. the Bible is the most uh, widely purchased, most thoroughly revered, and probably most broadly misunderstood book in the history of human civilization. 
One of the things that's misunderstood, at least by uh, my 19-year-old students at Chapel Hill, is that when we're reading the Bible, we're not actually reading the uh, words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We're reading translations from the Greek language in which these books were written. And something is always lost in translation. And not only that, but we're not reading translations of the originals of these books because we don't have the originals of these books or of any of the other books of the New Testament. What we have are copies made centuries later, many of them many, many centuries later. These thousands of copies that we have are all different from one another in lots of little ways and sometimes in big ways. There are places where we don't know what the authors of the New Testament originally wrote. Now for some Christians that's not a problem because they don't have a high view of scripture. For others it's a very big problem. What does it mean to say that God inspired the words of the, of the text if we don't have the words? Moreover, why should one think that God performed the miracle of inspiring the words of the Bible if he didn't perform the miracle of preserving the words of the Bible? If he meant to give us his very words, why didn't he make sure we received them? Uh, uh, we've seen recently, as we've gotten a much better grasp of the way the universe is put together and of how universes might exist, that the parameters for our universe, things like values of fundamental coupling constants, mm -hmm. appear to be at levels where they allow things like life to exist. Right. Now, now this, this, of course, is, is uh, great if you want to believe, you know, that <laughs> God made the laws of the universe so that life could exist. But a more prosaic <laughs> and uh, less divine <laughs> explanation is simply, oh, there's these different branches of the multiverse, right? There are different values for coupling constants of nature, for these what we call you know, fundamental constants of nature in each of them. And heck, we just happen to be in the ones that are where life can exist. Are you a chapel goer now, or no, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm, I'm of course entirely agnostic or atheist. I'm entirely atheist. Yes, atheist. yes, and always have been. Hmm. Yes. In, in fact, there were three, three experimental groups uh, from uh, prestigious institutions: Harvard, Duke, and the Mayo Clinic, that 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 were doing excellent, had done excellent. Uh, experiments on the efficacy of prayer. Uh, they all came out negative. These people, incidentally, were all, almost all believers. All the experimental, experimentalists were believers, as far as I could tell. But they were good scientists. They, they went where the data went, and the data did not support their, their, their beliefs. Obviously, they were hoping to, to demonstrate that, that uh, God existed by showing that prayer worked. But it could have. The point is, it could have. People who say that science has nothing to say about God are just wrong. Because you can uh, uh, demonstrate that a, a God, at least a God, capital G God, I call it, the God that most people worship, not the deist God. The deist God is, is, is one that we uh, could never rule out. We have no reason to believe in a deist God, uh, and, but we, uh, uh, we can't rule that out. But the, the theist God, the God that uh, plays such an important role in the universe, uh, should have been detected by now, and, that, and that's, that's the the uh, statement that I, I tried to, to make, and that's, I think, a, the proper position that science would take. But we're ready to, ready to hear the evidence to the contrary. Uh, uh, family life and absolutely absorbed by the synagogue, by bar mitzvahs, I was bar mitzvah, hmm. um, by all sorts of rituals, uh, Passover dinner and so on, without it ever seemed to me having any, or at least hardly any, correlative belief in anything of the theological or spiritual kind. I mean, this was um, absolutely phenomenological Judaism, right? And I think that's a very dominant pattern indeed, because maintaining the culture is maintaining the faith. Right? Well, I know certain theologians would take the expansion of the universe as recognizing that we can therefore not realistically try to get God's ultimate purpose constrained within this universal history. So if we're going to have that, which we 
believe as theologians. I put myself in their place for a moment. Yes. Uh, give me that yes. uh, 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 large S. Um, so that, that they now have to have a mechanism of saying, okay, at some point or something, that God would have to make some transformation because they can't, they can't have it naturally evolve because of w w what's happening in the, expan the accelerating expansion. Now, of course, I could imagine that there must be, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, but I would imagine there must be theologians who could come at it from lots of different angles on that, right? You, one might say that, well, that would suggest that the ultimate purpose um, it, it, you know, would be something, uh, if, if it has to be ultimate in time, um, which isn't necessarily uh, you know, yeah. taken for granted, but let's imagine that the, the uh, purpose has to end up somewhere, then maybe there's some reason that you want a very diffuse universe at the, at the end, and uh, you know, we, don't, we don't even know what, the, what that goal would be. So I, I imagine there'd be one group that would say that, another group might say, um, the only way to get the interesting things to happen in the middle is to have a universe that began this way and ends up that way, but right in the middle you get all the interesting stuff happening. <laughs> right. I mean, you could, I mean, it seems to be so many places that you could go with that same information that I'm not sure that it, 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 um, it nails the case of, is there a purpose that's, you know, that's written in the universe? Um, so this is an example of you know, if you look at the empirical facts, this kind of religion probably works. So this guy is a, um, he's a priest, and people come to him when they're sick or when their children are sick, and he gives them special potions. And the special potions actually work very often because he had gone to the city, to the pharmacy, to buy medicines, and then he comes back to his town, and he has things like, you know, antibiotics, and, you know, uh, the kids have inflammation and he goes and gives him a potion and the potions work often right so every and then he gets a lot of wives I and mean, that's what he gets out of this right and then the people get better so you know I, it's hard to argue against that system it, you know it works it's completely he's taking advantage of all these people but he's making them better so you know it's fuzzy whether religion is here is, is good or bad I think that my own personal opinion, it's pure opinion, is that I mean, that's a lot of what religion is about, you know, these, these uh, witch doctors who come actually figure out how to, how to uh, help people. Over the years, I've never dissociated myself from the Jewish background, uh, but never felt that I wanted to be identified as a religious, well, I'm not a religious or orthodox Jew, so I certainly haven't. The only times I've been back to a synagogue is when people got married and I wanted to attend the, the ceremony. And that's rare. I think the problem of the Odyssey is a very serious one. How does one explain the disasters in the world? I remember when Elian Gonzalez was rescued, so many religious people said, See, see, God is wonderful. He saved Elian Gonzalez with porpoises. Yeah, but what about the ones who died? Was God not responsible for their death? Oh, God works in mysterious ways. If you are willing as human beings to abdicate your intelligence, to a being who you don't understand or know, what will that lead you to? It will lead you to being Abraham. In the Bible, God comes down and says to Abraham, kill your son. Abraham says, sure. And he's prepared to kill his son. And there have been many Abrahams in the past. I'd like just to discuss how uh, mescaline works. And the, uh, these hallucinogenic drugs have a very specific action in two ways. Number one, they produce fantastic visual hallucinations. And these are described by the people that have them, who've been very uh, down to earth scientists, most of them have, like Ellis and Weir Mitchell and um, McDonald Critchley, very well known neurologists, as being more beautiful than anything that they've ever seen in normal art. They're, they are experiences of art, extremely powerful in all the respects of color and shape and so on, what makes art. And so the, also, some of these people have the kind of experience that Rama was describing, of sort of union with God, these mystical experiences, and so on. And these all act on uh, the serotonin 2A receptors. There's a specific receptor in the brain which all of these act on. The 1A receptors, the inhibitory ones, is one study done using imaging techniques, just recently published, of people who were psych, uh, two, control, two people, one group of people who are not psychologically interested in religion, and the other ones who were. And they measured the activation of the uh, 1A receptors on, on binding using uh, methods of uh, um, imaging methods. 
and they showed that the people who were religiously inclined had a decreased binding, very significant decreased binding to the 1A receptors. So the 1A receptors were not working. And they're the ones that inhibit the uh, activated ones by the LSD. So the two lines of evidence, the 2A receptors are activated by drugs that produce religious experiences, and the people who have them no normally have an underactive system which inhibits it. If I take religion seriously nowadays, as I do, uh, leading a number of recent projects at this institute, it is very much, as a social scientist, interested in what holds communities together, and yes, also to some extent in the spiritual commitments that individual human beings are capable of. All of that I find extremely interesting, mm. but I can't identify with any of it myself. Mm. And there have been areas of conflict between religion and science. Uh, by and large, religion has been on the retreat in those areas of overlap, as uh, scientists discovered more about the real world, which did conflict with earlier uh, uh, myths or beliefs. Um, and there still remain areas of deep conflict biology and in cosmology and uh, I don't think there is much room for compromise there as a scientist I mean I think uh, the, the truths that science reveals are truths according to this scientific criteria period and uh, be, if they conflict with some myth too bad uh, to have conviction is very different from having faith because conviction is a kind of belief that can be sensitive to evidence and argument. And the whole point of faith, indeed the, the virtue of faith, which is uh, praised by Christians and others, is precisely the strength to continue to believe something in the face of reason and evidence. And I used to watch for some reasons with a, another young man who trained as a bomb -aimer. And I was then a mild Christian, uh, I'd say a skeptical Christian, and he was a passionate atheist. And we talked for weeks and weeks and weeks as we watched the submarines. Uh, and when we got to England, he was a Christian and I was an atheist. <laughs> we sort of converted each other. Uh, being a scientist and staring immensity and eternity in the face every day is about as meaningful, I think, and grand and awe-inspiring as it gets, uh, we, especially we astronomers, confront the big questions of wonder every day and the answers to these questions in the aggregate have produced, and this is with absolutely no hype, have produced the greatest story that's ever been told and there isn't a religion, I think, that can offer anything better. And as Jules Verne said, reality provides us with facts so romantic that imagination itself could add nothing to them. And I say amen to that.